Happy Sabbath again. All right, so we come to another study on the Sabbath. <laughs> you know, it is, um, I thought this, the, this series would have been over already, but it's not, and we're going to keep going until God says it's over. And so we will talk about God's seal. Uh, we'll talk about God's seal today. And um, I'm sure, uh, in fact, I'm very sure that I will not give you half of what you need. And remember, whenever we do Bible studies or we do lesson studies in um, Sabbath school, it is just a little bit of what we need that we address. Let us pray. Well, you know, before we pray, let me say this. Um, I would ask that somebody removes Bob and Rose's passport because we will not let them out of the country of Florida. <laughs> so someone please take their passports. Go. We, we, we can't keep doing this. You keep messing with our emotions. Every time you leave, then we are saddened, and then we can't wait till you get back. And the DeWitts, I, I think we have an agreement. We're going to keep them already. So... <laughs> Father, we want to thank you for your, this privilege you give us, Lord. We are so grateful that in these times of relative peace that you continue to bless us with the ability to come and worship you in your sanctuary. So, Father, help us not to waste these times, these precious, precious times. And so I ask that you would give me that which I need to say and nothing more. In Jesus' name, amen. And then for all the ones I can't remember your names, <laughs> please, you know, we hope one day, I know you love up north so much, but I hope one day you will just hang out with us for a while. But at least I can look forward to heaven when we will be all together. All right, so... Let's um, start. So today's health nugget. Oh, by the way, health nugget reminds me. So I was thinking um, about that we, you know, we have not really done any major health thing. Who remembers the Uchipine experience? I still do, right? We haven't done anything. So I, I don't know about the health department. I don't want to tell you what to do. I'm just suggesting that we probably want to do something again because that was such a great time for us, right? But in the meantime, I'm going to, uh, because I, you know, I conduct the studies. Next time, if God allows me to, I'm going to declare a health day. And that's the next first Sabbath I speak. And we're going to study the eight laws of health, right? Just to kind of encourage us to live healthier. And I have asked someone, you won't know who will be, but you need to come. There is a special person that will give us a little talk on mental health. And you ought to be here because I won't miss it. We ought to be here because, you know, I see students on a weekly basis that struggle with mental health, especially with COVID and just other things going on. And so I asked this individual if the person would just grace us with her presence and just help us out a little bit. On So that's June 4th, June 4th. So if you know some folks that you think should learn a little bit more about health, including us, right, please invite them. So we're, we're looking at peaches, you know, and so, some of you have eaten peaches. And you're like, ah, it's peach. I don't know if I like peaches, you know. Well, we are, we are blessed uh, on our property, and we have a couple of peach trees coming in. There's one that actually gave us some peach, and um, the caterpillars took most of the peaches, and they left us a little bit. <laughs> I wish we could have taken it because picking a peach from a tree that you have nurtured with natural stuff and tasting it is so different from a peach from the store that tastes like nothing. I mean, I, I picked one and, and brought it in and Kain and I had it and Jess, I think Jess and Micah had peach and 
But we didn't have enough, right? Because like I said, the caterpillars took most of them. But they did leave us a couple. But peaches are really good for you. Packed with nutrients and antioxidants. Very good for you. Then, gentlemen, vitamins A, C, E, and K. Potassium, niacin, and much more. Then we continue. Cancer-fighting compounds. You know, many of us need these things. All of us need these things. Help with our eyesight. You know, I, I love peaches, so it's not a big deal for me to eat it. I just wish we grew more. And then it keep our bones healthy. Healthy bones, we need that. And then help to reduce allergy symptoms. So, I, you know, I'm allergic to oak and grass. So yesterday I cut the um, grass and it was, um, you know, I, not, I started not feeling well after cutting the, 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 the grass, you know, but I am. If I'm driving and I smell cut grass, I, it bothers me. So I have a little allergy thing going on today. But, you know, someone has to cut the grass and that would be me. Um, I like cutting it actually, but I am allergic to it. And then peaches boost your immunity. Right? I've tried to share with you the things that boost your immunity because that's the way. We need to learn to boost our immunity naturally. Naturally. Those are the things we need to use. All right? So from now on, if you don't like peach, even though the store-bought peach is not the best, get some anyway. It's still going to have some use for you. So, you know, Becky, tell... Um, um, Dennis, it's, it's peaches. Cause you know, we all, we send him in the back to go count the dollars and he never hears the health nugget anymore. You know, he's gonna quit. You know, cause he likes the health nuggets. Alright, so remember, it's peaches. Alright, so, today we're looking at the Sabbath again. Now, notice this thing says, for centuries, the great controversy are controversy, depending on where you're from, it, both pronunciations are correct, between Christ and Satan has continued. It's been going on for a very long time. And eventually, it will be over. Do you believe that? It will be over. Just hang in there. That controversy began in heaven when Lucifer rebelled against God. And I kind of put some verses where you can do Dennis, it's peaches, man. Peaches. Your wife's going to buy you some peaches, okay? All right. So, we know that's going on. Now, it is evident from this verse, and there are other verses in the Word of God, that Christ lets us know, these are the words of Christ, Christ lets us know that the devil, Satan, is going to convince most people to be on his side. You know that, right? It's, we, we are to work like we can save not we, but through the Holy Spirit that indwells us, we're going to get people to make a decision for Christ. We need to work hard to save the world. But we need to, be, to realize that we ought not get disappointed or despondent or upset or angry because people have a choice to make. We made a choice to be here today. There are people who make choices to be somewhere else. So, Christ is letting us know that there are many that will be lost. But this is not because he chooses that. They choose to be lost. If it were up to God, everybody would be saved. But we're not robots. Okay? So Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, they use different words, but straight actually means narrow. Right, And then it says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. You see, people don't like rules. And so when they see rules, even though the rules are good for us, they're like, no, that's too narrow for me. You know, I, I can't drive all my sins through that gate. You know, I, I have a big old tractor trailer full of sins that I need to take with me. And, and, and the gate that we need to go through is not wide. 
it's not broad. In 14, Jesus says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And how many? Few there be that find it. Now, when he says find it, it's not because it's hard to find. It's because they don't want to find it. Many of them, many of individuals see the gate, but they don't want to go through it. They have chosen to go somewhere else. But you and I don't trust in our senses or what we see, what we hear, uh, and think we know who those people are, because we do not. So we work for everyone as if they're going to make it through that narrow gate. And so we are to, it doesn't matter. If you look at some of the kings back in um, Israel, there's some of them you thought would never have made it. But when they come around, eventually. And some we thought would, never did. Okay? So we need to be very careful that we don't start making decisions. That's what the true judging is. You know, when someone says, don't judge me, right? It's when we start saying who's going to go to heaven or hell. That's the judging. But if you are bearing spoiled fruit and bad fruit, and I talk to you and say, hey, man, your fruit's smelling a little bit, you know? Then people say, well, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you that you're not, it's not the fruit of the Spirit, all right? So, all right, let's keep going. It says, only a few, only a few, We'll respond to God's invitation. And what is God's invitation? We find this is part of which angel's message? The first angel's message, right? But the latter part says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Friends, there are many who do not accept this invitation. But it doesn't matter how often they reject it. We need to still provide the invitation. And so that's why we keep doing Bible studies. We keep from the pulpit or from our one-on-one or from in Sabbath school or wherever, at people's homes, wherever it is. Or even if someone just asks you a question. You know, someone asked me a question and... I, and it was a great opportunity. I said, I'm about to go to lunch. Do you want to come to lunch with me? The person said, oh, I don't have any swipes on my card. So what I mean, so what we do, uh, part of our benefit at, my, at the university, they, they, you go pay and they put discounted uh, you know, meals on your thing. So I said, I have a lot. Don't worry about it. Let's go to lunch. And then we're talking at lunch and you, know, you get chances to just study with people. And then after we ate, um, then I said, do you mind walking for a little bit? I said, I like to walk after lunch, you know, that, what they call that, that digestive walk, right? So I like to walk a little bit. And the person, yeah, I'll walk with you, gave me more time to talk to them till we got back to the office. So a Bible study doesn't have to be planned, sit down and do it. You don't even have to have a Bible, but it's good if Bible verses are here. And you don't have to necessarily quote the scripture. You can paraphrase it for them. Because you never know how someone will accept something. So you have to trust God to lead you to do that. So whenever God gives you an opportunity to do a Bible study, do it. All right? Doesn't have to actually say, well, let me go get my Bible and see what's going on. So in whose image was man made? In God's image, right? We see that in Genesis 1, 26, just the first part. says, and God said, let whom? Let I. Uh, why do you think I said I? Do you, you know that people are saying there's one true God, right? Uh, and Jesus isn't God and the Holy Spirit isn't God. So unless God doesn't understand languages, he, he says, let us. Suggest more than one person, right? Okay, now you have another group that they have, they have accepted that, well, you know, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is God. So now the Holy Spirit is not God. The Holy Spirit is either some impersonal thing 
or it is Christ. Do you know that? There is a saying now that the spirit is really not a third person, of, but is actually Christ. You know, like Christ's essence, they call it. So that's why we need to study the word of God. So, you know, God says, God, and by the way, when you look up the Hebrew, the, the uh, yes, the Hebrew word for God, it's Elohim, the plural version of God. It says, and God said, let us make man in whose image? Our image after our likeness. Now, that is true. It was true, and it still is true for Adam and Eve. <laughs> Ours is our image has been adjusted. Why? Were we created in the same image that Adam and Eve were created? God's image, but what? Marred with sin. Turn, I, I apologize, it's not on the screen. Turn to Genesis chapter 5. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. See, this one verse may be skipped by some of us. And it says, Adam lived how many years? 130 years. And he begot a son in whose likeness? In his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. Now, did Adam beget Seth before or after sin? After sin. So we are still in God's image, but God's image marred by sin. So we have to understand that, right? Because we, we, we just say, yeah, we are created. Genesis 1.26 says, Yes, but we need to also modify that with Genesis 5, 3, that sin, right? Because Adam and Eve were perfect. David says we were not perfect. What is it? I, I may misquote it. Born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's the paraphrase, okay? So we are, yes, we're still in God's image, but marred by sin. Now, can we get back to being in God's image fully? Yes, we have to be obedient. Do you know there is a time coming that we're going to have glorified bodies? Who would like glorified bodies? I would. No more sickness, no more allergies. Seriously, that will be a very good time. You know, if you, if you are sick, like I have allergies and my wife sometimes, her asthma picks up, kicks in, you know, if you have anything going on, and some people have way more ailments than we have, and you don't want a glorified body, man, sin has really beaten you up. <laughs> because you should want a glorified body. All right, let's look at number two. Through whom is God's image restored in man? It's through God, um, call Jesus. So let's take a look at that. It says, in whom the God of this world, which is Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, friends, what happened to Enoch? He walked with God, and he was translated. Talk about someone that accepted the renewing of the image, right? He walked with God, and, and you should read about Enoch in the spirit of prophecy. Excellent. I wish I could um, tell you. It's in um, Patri not, um, yeah, Patriarchs and Prophets, right? Um, and, um, but when you read the story of Enoch, can't remember the chapter. You know, I not too long went through that. It is such a beautiful story, such a beautiful story. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. <laughs> that would be something else. You know, wouldn't it be something else if one first Sabbath, um, you're looking for Pissard? You know, this would be great. I said, where's Pissard? And they say, he's not. <laughs> I mean, that would be great. You know, but I'm no Enoch. Um, plus, you know, I, I have asked God to help me to go through the time of trouble because I'd like to be in the 144. Um, 
Now, you may say that's a tough ask, but guess what? God can do anything God wants to do. And I am allowing him by his grace to have his own way in my life, right? Anyone who comes to God in faith will be changed in God's image by his Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? If we believe that, then let the Holy Spirit work in us. Accept when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, let him work in and through us. You know, in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the word of God says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is called by a number of different names. Right? Our reference. Like Jesus is called the Son of God, he's called the Son of Man. Okay, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, and so people tend to say, "Well, He's not really the third person of the Godhead." Okay, and and I'm not saying I know everything about that topic, but I know what the Word of God says. Okay, and individuals have actually used, and this is where we run into trouble of making people think we're a cult. We try to use Sister White's writings to refute what the Word of God says. If that's how we use Sister White's writings, no wonder people feel certain ways about us. Okay? Because we're going to look at something else, right? So here it is that we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know what? Go to John 16. I usually quote a piece of this verse, but we're going to look at the entire verse, okay? Again, remember, people are saying, well, it's Christ's spirit or it's God's spirit. The Holy Spirit is just some essence. Go to John 16, verse 13. And in John 16, 13, assuming you're there, it says, how be it when he the spirit of truth, so he's called the spirit of truth, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth, and he shall, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, the word he references a thing or a person? A person. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit. He references, the word himself references a thing or a person. Seven times, seven times in one verse, the Holy Spirit is referenced as a person. So how dare us say that the Holy Spirit is not? A person. It's something. That's what the word of God says. But yet still we have those. And these are people you, you may respect. And know. And, and they speak truth. But they say the Holy Spirit is not God. It's not even a person. It is some essence. That's, but that's what. If you look at it. I should have had it on the screen. If you look at that verse. It clearly tells you. And then another one I can't remember. When Jesus said that he will go. And he'll send another comforter. How could Jesus. Talk to me. How is Jesus going to say I'm going to go. I'm going to send you someone else. But then it's him that's coming back. I, I don't understand that. Right. But, but they can't even keep the, 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 their argument straight. And so we have to be compassionate still and loving and say, here's the deal, man. Please do not misrepresent what Sister White is saying and do not try and refute the word of God because the word of God is clear that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. All right? Okay, let's keep going. Now, number three, what is a seal? Well, let's look at what is a seal. So a seal is normally something that, you know, you, that it's important, 
All right, so it says, it is a device which reproduces an image. This is kind of a definition. It's a device that re reproduces an image in a soft substance like wax or clay. It says, anciently rulers had rings which were used as seals. If you had that ring, you get some wax, you put it on, hey, you had the authority of the ruler, right? Today, most legal documents require the seal of a notary public to be binding. Trust me, there are certain things. You don't get that notary public signature. It is not worth anything. Can't tell you how many times I'm running around campus. You know, Not too many times, but there are a few times that I'm like, come on, I know a few of you here are notary public. So now I've learned who on campus are notaries so I can go to them and say, do we have any notary? People in here? No? All right, there you go. But, all right, we have to see you every Sabbath. Okay. But we need to have, we need somebody, we should have people in our family that is, and there it is, buddies, right? We need, because so many times we need that one, and now you have to go, no, I think you can go to what? Banks or places like that, and they may have one, right? But that's important. So the seal is extremely, extremely important. But let's look at this part. Soft substance like wax or clay. Are you soft like wax or clay? Or like stone and granite? Think about us, right? Are we soft like wax or clay? Or we're like stone or granite? Is God able to seal us? Or if he tries to seal us, he can't because there's no place for the seal to go. In Ezekiel, turn, please turn to Ezekiel 36, 26. Because if you feel like, man, you know, I'm not the wax or the clay I should be, then there's a solution. Ezekiel 36, 26, I, I believe. Ezekiel 36, 26. So let's say we're not the soft receptive thing we should. In Ezekiel 36, 26, what does the word of God say? A what kind of heart? A new heart will I also will I give you. And a what? A new spirit, what will they do? Put within you. And I will take away the what kind of heart? The stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. So if you feel, if we feel that we are not receptive to the seal of God, then we need to pray to God. Remove the stony heart. Give me a heart of flesh that we may accept the will, the seal of God. By whom is the sealing accomplished? Now, you know, some people say the Holy Spirit is the seal. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit does the sealing, okay? So let's take a look at a couple of verses. It says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed. Now, here's the issue. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But we know that the Holy Spirit is not this thing. The Holy Spirit is a person, and he, as you look at more verses, you will find that he does the sealing. And we'll look at some verses, but one I don't have, as I'm thinking about, uh, Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. Let's look at what Ephesians 4.30 says. It's very powerful. It says, and do what? And grieve not the Holy Spirit. Why shouldn't we grieve the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God, it says. I apologize. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, notice, never talk about grieving God the Father or grieving Jesus God the Son says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Why is that the case? The Holy Spirit is the member of the Godhead that is working with us. 
So if we grieve the Holy Spirit and, and we force the Holy Spirit to leave us, then what is left of us? Nothing. This, the Holy Spirit is that comforter that God sent to us to help us through these tough times and draw us to Christ. You know, in number five, it says, under the new covenant, where is God's sealed place? Well, we know where it's going to be placed. Where is it going to be placed? In our hearts, right? And our heart and mind are linked. Right? It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. You see, you can't just have a head knowledge of who God is. We need a heart knowledge. We need to experience God in our hearts, our souls, our minds. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Friends, we should be striving daily to be to, to God a people, because he is to us a God. And in Romans 5, 5 says, And hope make it not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, number six. What condition will Jesus produce in his church? And so in these verses, Jesus compares his church to individuals. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, we're not talking about relationships, but I would say, if you're looking, if as a woman you're looking to get married, and the individual that you're looking at, you know, get past the brawny look. Get past the, the, the handsome face. Get past the, the debonair dress wear, right? If you believe this person will not give his life for you, tell him keep stepping, and you will keep praying for him, that he'll be saved. If too often, and it mentions, you know, husband loving your wives, you know, but I, so I will focus because I'm a husband. Too often, women look at the wrong things. And yes, it's good to have a good provider. Yes, it's good to have a defender. Yes, all that. But if the person is not Christ-like in their behavior, you want to step away from that situation. Because you get married, either you're going to live with that situation or then now you're going to get divorced. And God says, I hate divorce. And you see, even though my wife and I had issues because I wasn't the husband I should have been, I did remember that verse continuously. God hates divorce. And so we worked it out. But it took a God who is loving to say to me, Pissard, you need to change. And a wife who is understanding that, uh, know that I could change. But she has some changing to do too. Let's not always put it on the guy only. Amen? All right. So Christ, in the, the word of God comes to say, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Are we, who is the word, by the way? Jesus. Are we studying the word of God daily? Are we internalizing the word of God? Or do we get so busy? You know, Psalm 119, uh, 105 says, Thy word is a what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If we're not studying the word of God, we are walking around like blind men in darkness. And so we are cleansed by the word of God, which is Jesus. And you're like, well, how do you know that? Well, you know, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay? All right, let's keep going. Number, uh, verse 27 says, that he might present it, the church, which is us, present it to whom? To himself, a glorious church, not having spot 
or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Isn't that a good thing? If God can say to us, say of us, you are holy and without blemish. But we can't do that of ourselves. See, too often we rely on our own strength. Our strength at best is weakness. It is only God that is strong. Number seven says, how does John describe God's people at the end of time? Now, I get excited when I hear about the 144,000 because like I said, I've prayed to be in this group. And it says, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. Man, talk about being sealed. This is us being sold out for God. You know, we are obedient to him. We have made a conscious choice. In spite of when they take away everything that we have, all the work Cain and I are doing on the farm, back-breaking work sometimes. And even though we have tools, God has blessed us with things to move things around. Like yesterday, she was having fun driving our John Deere Gator, moving mulch from one place to the next. But it's still back-breaking work to get the mulch in there. And then it's hard work to tilt it over, right? But at least we don't have to take it from, one, from A to B. The, 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 the Gator does that for us. The bottom line, even when they take that away. Can you see, remember, with God's people, we are sealed here. With Satan's, they're going to believe either here or they're going to do it because they say, well, I have to take care of my family. I have to work. I have to eat. Well, when Elijah didn't have food, how did he get food when he was by the brook? God sent it to him. And then when... That went out. God sent him to a woman that just had a little bit of meal, a little oil. For how many years? Three and a half years. Never ran out. You see, these are not stories. This is his story. These are things that happened. The word of God is his story. Not just some story. So I remember I used to say, yeah, I love this story in the Bible. No, I love the history in the Bible. Because a story suggests it could be false. But then we continue. It says, there, these are they which were not defiled with women. I can't remember which, I think it was Pastor Doug one time was preaching, and he said, some guy he knew said, man, I'm not getting married. <laughs> no, in prophetic and symbolic language, what does woman mean? Church. So Pastor Doug hopefully convinced him that, man, if you want to get married, get married. That's not what this is talking about. We are not defiled by churches. It says, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And I love verse 5, which is misquoted. Well, they leave off a part of it in all the new versions. It says, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault. Many new versions stop right there. But the King James Version says, For they are without fault before the throne of God. Can you imagine? God pulls you up and says, Sister Carol, or my daughter Carol, you are without fault before me. You know why? Because we have accepted the robe of righteousness from Christ. It's not because you didn't do anything sinful. It's because Jesus covered you. And you accept his robe of righteousness. And he takes your filthy rag, uh, cloth that is filthy rag, and he gets rid of that. And you don't want to know what filthy rag is actually. <laughs> Disgusting. All right? So, let's keep going. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. See, God knows all of us. He knows. They're pretenders, pretending that they are gods, and they sometimes make the most noise. But God knows his people. It says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
And so I was looking up the word iniquity, uh, I think, last night. I said, you know what? The word iniquity is used so many times in the Bible, but at different times, there are different words, Greek words that have been used. And so I looked this one up last night, so I didn't internalize it, so I put it here for you. It says, it is adikia, and it means unrighteousness. So it says, and let everyone that name it the name of Christ depart from their unrighteousness. You know the one way? See, a lot of times we focus on getting rid of a bad habit, and we never accomplish that. You know one way they tell you to help? Focus on the good habit. I, uh, I was speaking to a lady this week uh, about some health stuff. She asked me for some um, some health points. You know, she knows I've been doing health nuggets, some health nuggets. So I sent her, um, I, I put together a PowerPoint of health nuggets and sent to her. And we were talking on the phone and she said, you know, she went to an Adventist place to get a health cleanse, you know? And she and it was like a, a month-long health cleanse. And she said, man, I paid for that health cleanse. But she said, you know, one of the things that happened when I started the health cleanse, I was thinking about, man, I, I can't wait to be done with this to get a steak. <laughs> but that's what she started with. And she's like, Passard, when I got back home, who wanted steak? Not me. <laughs> she didn't want a steak because she was so focused on getting healthy. Now, when she got back, steak was away from her. She says, I've never had a steak since. Right? So sometimes, yeah, we trust God to help us, but there are things we can do. Instead of focusing on, I need to stop doing this, focus on doing the other thing, what you should be doing. And that will and build that habit. I have heard it said it takes about 28 days to build that positive habit. Keep doing it. And when you feel like stopping, keep doing it because redemption is near. There's a time when you won't want that. It's like me. I will, you know, I'm very transparent. You know that, right? I was a um, plant-based, well, we used to call ourselves vegetarian or vegan, I can't remember, before we went plant-based. And I would go to my parents, and if they had certain type meat dishes, I would eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl, no, he's curry goat. <laughs> She's like, why are you eating your friend? True. I should not have been eating my friend. Right, but I would eat. I would be literally. We would not have any meat, no, no eggs. Uh, you know, we would. I think we had cheese, right, back then. No, no, we had stopped. But I'd go to my parents, and they had curry goat, and I would eat it. And then I had to decide that you have to. And I remember going there one day, and I said, No, I, I, I'm not eating this. The temptation was great because I grew up on this thing, you know. And I said to my parents, no, no more, can't do it. And it was easier the next time, mommy, and it was easier the next time, and it was easier the next time, all right? So trust God, but you have, God doesn't remove your will from you. You, you give it to him, and he gives you his will, all right? All right, let's keep going. What is another illustration of the work of the Holy Spirit and its effect on the characters of God's people. Now, you have heard about the former and latter rain, right? So in Hosea, it says, then, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. Now, the way you need to think about rain, having grown up on a farm, you know, in the country in Jamaica, no, and they didn't call it farmer and ladder rain, but how it works is normally when they plant, they plant at a certain time expecting the rain, and the rain helps the seed to germinate. So that's the form of rain in our lives, right? We, the seed is planted, the rain of the Holy Spirit comes on us, and it germinates the seed. And then who wants to tell me, you know, what, is the, what do you think we need a lot of rain for? To ripen, to prepare for the harvest. So, you know, we have some sprinkling of um, lot of rain going on right now, but it's going to come full force. It's going to be a true, true rain 
And so when the latter rain comes, what that would do is to ripen the grain or the fruit or whatever to prepare it for harvest. And so that's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. You know, in Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. You know, the early reign of the Holy Spirit enables a person to grow in grace. If we take a look at our lives, if we take inventory of our lives each year and we do not see growth in grace, something is wrong. We ought to be closer to God today than we were last month and two months ago. And three months, and a year ago. And if we're not seeing that, go to God. Ask him, show me. Show me what's going on in my life. Why am I? You will not remain stagnant. Either you're going backwards or you're going forwards. So we need to be experiencing the, rain, the growth of grace in our lives. It says, the final outpouring of God's spirit in the latter rain will prepare his church for the harvest. When is the harvest, friends? When Jesus comes. In Revelation 14, the latter verses in Revelation 14 tells you that there are two harvests. This is not the time to dive into them. There, I actually did a study on those. But there are going to be the harvest of the wicked, which is not good, and the harvest of the righteous. All right? It says, in their experience, God's law will be sealed in the minds of his followers. We're talking about God's seal. It says, how can I enter into God's rest? Word of God says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We can only come boldly to the throne of grace if we are obedient. If we try to go to God's throne of grace boldly and we're being disobedient, that's just presumption and you may be killed. You need to be very careful not to be offering profane fire before God, okay? So therefore, when, we, when the word of God says, come boldly, those, are, those of us who love God, we are being obedient to him. It says that ye may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Says, what has God especially designated as the sign of his relation to his people? What is his seal? Says, remember the fourth commandment, right? His Sabbath. Says, remember the Sabbath day to do what? Keep it holy. How many days? Six days shall we labor and do all our work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And then what else does it say? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and holiday. Now, when we think of a seal, a seal has um, three things. Okay? A seal has three things going on. So let's look at the three things. A seal has a name. So in the fourth commandment, the name is the Lord thy God. The seal also has a title. The Lord thy God did what? Created. Right? So he is creator. So there are two of the three parts of the seal. And then... If you have a seal, you also have to have something else. You need to have a domain or a territory. Heaven and earth. He's the one that created everything. So we know the seal of God is in his law, more specifically in his fourth commandment. And so by obedience, we accept the seal of God and we're obedient to not just the fourth commandment because but to all the commandments, because what did John, uh, not John, um, James say in James 2.10? He 
He says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. See, you and I can't, we can choose to, to our detriment and our demise. We can cho choose to break a law, a part of the law, but it won't be good. You see, Satan does not care if you just break one precept in the law. Satan only needs one little percent of disobedience. God requires 100% obedience. And so many of us don't want to do that. We're like, well, you know, but, you know, um, stealing a little tithe, not that bad, you know, because I need to pay my rent. You know, stealing offering, and then that's the real gray area in their mind. But the word of God tells us in Malachi that what? We rob God in tithes and offering. Because there are individuals who return tithe, and you will see a nice size tithe come in, and then you, try, you can't find, you think the offering probably you know, fell off the envelope because you can't find it. And treasurers see this all the time. That's why it's so important to have confidential treasurers <laughs> so they don't let out your secret. But when I was an assistant treasurer, I saw this all the time. All the time. Where you'd have people return uh, tithes, but then you have the others that do a double tithe for their offering. You know, so there's the, we like to talk about the ones, and then those are others where they give as much as they can give. You know, but there are some that, that little gray area there for them, but they're no gray area. We should give, a, you know, a faithful offering. And we wonder sometimes why God does not bless us more than he does. In Revelation 7, 1 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And the word of God says, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. There's a hurting coming on this earth. Friends, which side are we going to be on? Are, go are we going to be those who are sealed by the living God? Or are we going to be those who refuse to accept the seal? We need to be obedient. We need to accept the seal of God. You know, in letter 76, 1900, servant of the Lord says, many will not receive the seal of God because they do not keep his commandments or bear the fruits of righteousness. See, friends, when we accept God's commandments, we are able to keep God's commandments through his power, not ours. Of ourselves, we cannot keep God's commandments. But when we trust him every day, when we trust in the Lord every day, he will help us. In fact, I can tell you there are many times and there are times when I fail where God will tell me something. The Holy Spirit will reveal something that is going to happen. It's like, hey, this is happening. Deal with it this way. And I fail. I, I know. And th th whatever happens, happens. And I fail. And I, you know, and I, I find somewhere quickly to ask for forgiveness. I do not wait because I don't take that risk. I will not take the risk to wait till I get home to pray for forgiveness. That's a Catholic thing. You know, where, well, just bring your indulgences and say your Hail Marys and whatever, you know, and wait. No, no, no. As soon as the Holy Spirit reveals to you that you have sinned, find somewhere, and if you can't move, ask for forgiveness in your mind. But what I do, I quickly get to my office if I can, and I pray to God. I get down on my knees and I pray to God and ask for forgiveness. Don't wait. You see, those who don't keep God's commandments is in terrible shape. Please turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're about to wrap up. 
but I believe it's important that I extend this study by sharing a couple of things with you. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 21 and verses 20, verses 21 through 23. Let me shut the Bible so you know that we're almost done, okay? So, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Jesus is speaking. This is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth what? The will of my Father which is in heaven. Then he continues. Now if he stopped there, we'd like, well, what is God's will? Well, he doesn't stop. He said, Many shall say, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now let's stop before we go to verse 23. Is prophesying in Jesus' name a good thing? Yes. Casting out devils in Jesus' name is a good thing? Double yes. And triple yes, doing many wonderful works? Yes, yes, and yes. But then Jesus says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Now, if he stopped there, again, he would leave us to wonder. How can you tell me, Jesus, that you never knew me, but I am prophesying your name, I'm casting out devils in your name, I'm doing many wonderful works, I am doing studies every single Sabbath, except sometimes on third Sabbath. And you're telling me you never knew me? What kind of God are you? And then he says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so the word Jesus, the word that iniquity, the English word iniquity is translated from is anomia in the Greek. And that iniquity is different from the, um, the previous one. This one, anomia, means contempt for and violation of the law, more specifically the moral law of God. So Jesus said, yeah, you did all those things, or at least you said you did them in my name. At least that's how you, you voiced it. But you were a lawbreaker. You, were, you showed contempt for my law. You violated my law. Therefore, if you did not keep my law, I don't know you. Depart from me. And then people say, but the law of God is so restrictive. The law of God is about love. That's what he said in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. He says, when, they, when he was asked by a lawyer, um, which is the great law in the um, first and great law in the commandment, and he, uh, uh, commandment in the law, and he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. But he did not stop there. He says, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, on all the law and the prophets. Now, what did Jesus do? He just summarized the laws, the, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. We know them, right? We're not going to rehearse them. But the first one just says, don't have any gods before me. Don't make or bow down to images. Don't take his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath, right? Honor the Sabbath. That's love for God. And let me say this. If we don't love God, we can't love each other. I'll, I'll share that, remind you of this in 1 John. So it, it, then, the, then the next six says what? Honor our appearance. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't um, steal. Don't bear false witness or lie. And don't covet. So Jesus is saying, here's the deal, man. If you don't keep the commandments, you're breaking the law. The law is about love. That's all the law is. The law is about love. And so if you choose not to keep the commandments, you do not want to love me and you don't want to really love each other. Didn't he say in John 14, 15, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. And then here, the last two verses I'll share with you. In 1 John, I'll remind you of 1 John 5, 2, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we have to love God first, and the way we show we love God is to keep his commandments. And then in verse 3, he says, For, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, 
and his commandments are not grievous. They're not hard. You know why? Because he helps us to keep them. Friends, let's keep God's holy Sabbath day. We are the series about the Sabbath, but you can't separate the Sabbath from the commandments. It is in there. Now, some people say it's in the middle of the commandments. No, it's not, because it's the fourth commandment. The last time I checked middle, right, middle kind of drops right in there. It's four out of ten, right? It's in there, right? So, but we need to keep all God's commandments. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the privilege you give me, you continue to give me, to study with your people. I pray, Lord, that you forgive me for anything I said or did that is unlike you. Remove, forgive me for that and remove it from us and put into our hearts, minds, and souls that which I should have said. In Jesus' name, amen.